Um, welcome back to this session. Uh, my name is George Demiris. I'm with Penn AI Tech at the University of Pennsylvania. And it's a great joy to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Jeremy Green. Professor Jeremy Green chairs the Johns Hopkins University Department of the History of Medicine and directs the Center for Medical Humanities and Social Medicine. He serves as core faculty in the Johns Hopkins Drug Access and Affordability Initiative and associate faculty at the Berman Institute of Bioethics and holds joint appointments in the Department of History of Science and Technology and the Department of Anthropology at the Krieger School of Arts and Sciences. His research explores the ways in which medical technologies come to influence our understanding of what it means to be sick or healthy, normal or abnormal. His most recent book, Doctor Who Wasn't There, Technology History and the Limits of Telehealth, published in 2022 by University of Chicago Press, has been described as gripping history that shows how the electronic devices that we use to access care influence the kind of care we receive. Bringing his skills as a physician and historian to bear, Professor Green presents the urgent stakes to build a more equitable future for American healthcare. And today he will speak to us about the promise of pitfalls, promise and pitfalls of electronic medicine and implications for future commercialization. Thank you. Thanks so much, George. Um, thanks, George, and thanks to the organizer of this conference. Thanks to all of you. I've learned so much in the time I've been here today, and I especially appreciated the, the poster sessions. Um, <laughs> really quite wonderful examples of ingenuity in all sorts of different forms and imagining technological adaptations that might help to approach unmet problems and present needs in the world of, of aging. Um, and with particular focus on AI, but also moving beyond AI to think about all different sorts of encounters with digital technologies that might actually imagine a better future. So it, it's quite inspirational and quite fascinating. And, and typically the historian here at this kind of moment is here to give a kind of a gloomy message, right? Like we historians, we, we work to get ourselves disinvited almost from conferences by basically giving people messages like this thing that you think is new, it, it's not as new as you think it is, right? Nobody wants to hear that, right? Like all of you wanna be doing breathtakingly new work. And so I, I like to lean back instead on the, um, on the adage by uh, Mark Twain, right, which is that, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, uh, but it often rhymes. And so what I'd like to do here today is um, not to tell you that what you are all doing has already happened, because it hasn't, but to offer a space for reflection and to ask some of the things that we can do thinking historically about technology that might help us realize better outcomes with the technological engagements we do in the present and future. Um, and I, I should say, I, I'm passing around an object. Um, I've learned never to give talks without props. So if, if something odd comes your way, just take a look at it, consider it for a moment, pass it on to someone who hasn't had it yet. See if you, perhaps you, you know what it is already, or perhaps you might hazard a guess. It is a little sticky, um, but that, it came that way, and I can tell you it's non-toxic and non-organic. Um, but I, um, I, I also, I'm very happy to, you know, occupy this odd space of keynote in the sense, oftentimes a keynote happens at the beginning of a conference, right? In order to frame questions in common and then get out of the way of the real work of the conference. But really what I'm doing here is offering a space for reflection. And it's based on, uh, it's, it's based in part on a book I've recently written uh, called The Doctor Who Wasn't There, Technology, History and the Limits of Telehealth. But if we frame telehealth here, not to mean a history of how we do telemedicine, a subject all of us have come to know quite intimately during the pandemic and as patients and providers. Um, but to think about um, the way that we mediate care through electronic uh, frameworks, um, because telehealth is just one way of understanding the promise and also the fears that we have when we take care, which we think of as up close and personal, and we understand it to be mediated. And, and there's all kinds of benefits that can come in that mediation. There's all kinds of fears that come from there um, as well. And um, I, I also would like to hold up another book. And this, re this refers back to the uh, initial conference with, with, with the, the, the morning session with Jason Carlowish um, and Deborah Matthews and Emily Largent. Um, and I wanna hold up uh, Jason's book, The Problem of Alzheimer's, How Science, Culture, and Politics Turned a Rare Disease into a Crisis and What We Can Do About It. Because this book is not specifically about Alzheimer's or aging or dementia, this book is. And I think somewhere at the convergence of these is the kind of conversation I'd like to build. Because um, I, I think one of the problems that Jason begins this book with is the sense that Alzheimer's has not been ignored as a problem, 
but rather it has been approached as a certain kind of a problem. And I was just speaking with one of the poster presenters out in the hallway whose introduction said 99.6% of Alzheimer's drug targets fail, right? And, and one way of looking at that statistic in a room like this is to then ask, why do we continue to think that drugs are the right kind of technology with which to solve a problem like Alzheimer's? And I think the rest of Jason's book details other kinds of technological imaginaries, which could say the technological imaginary in biomedicine is often reduced to being synonymous with the biomedical worldview, which reduces complex problems, existential social problems down to lesions or molecules to be fixed on a molecular basis, right? And we know in Alzheimer's that is not what has been working. And we know a lot of other things offer quite a bit. So how do we think about the pro-social technology in this space? Um, so that being said, I wanna start out, hopefully the, the slightly sticky oblong object has made its way around most of the world right now. I wanna ask, do any of you know what this is? Okay, great. I'm gonna show you another cultural artifact. This is what we do as historians. This is a historical document at this point to help explain a bit more about this object. And then I want you to attend to this, this document I'm gonna show you. Think about what you notice, what you observe, what is the problem being identified? What solution is being offered technologically? Hopefully this will work. Nope. <laughs> it's inevitable in a talk by a historian of technology that at some point the technology has to not work, but I'll work on it right here. There we go. Don't, don't you feel better? I, I actually find, I always feel better after watching that. Um, and part of it is the emotional manipulation that comes with um, the, the, the scoring of, of a, a sophisticated audiovisual presentation. I should add that I am not paid any money by ClinCloud or by the manufacturers of any other device in here. Um, but nor, nor do I have any you know, particular you know, animosity or critique towards ClinCloud, but I offer this as an object lesson. Um, what is ClinCloud? What is the problem that is being displayed? What is the solution? All right, no idea. Home diagnostics for sure. Other thoughts? What's the problem? Okay, I, I heard peace of mind. I think that's part of a solution. Having to go to the clinic and a worried doctor. Yeah, so this is, um, I, I think, no, the, the, you guys are an engaged audience. This is fantastic. So yeah, so, so here you have this space in which the problem is being clearly displayed as the inconvenience to a patient or to the parent of a patient in having to do this thing to receive care that is to actually move oneself and a sick body some distance to the centralized location of caregiving, which is really built at the convenience of a medical profession. And in many ways, the architecture of care is built on a power gradient, which privileges providers over patients. So the, the clinic cloud, by actually leveraging um, the, the base of a smartphone, you know, and, and hooking up a digital stethoscope and a digital thermometer, um, allows uh, more agency to be given to the patient as a consumer in this process, right? And I heard some of you also say that, you know, that there's a, there's um, a problem for the provider as well. So providers can be irritated having to actually receive too many calls about potentially trivial things. This might be a filtering device. 
Um, and I heard someone say something about coughing, which is to say, yes, there's this prevalence of this idea that one is actually safer to actually get care in one's home than to actually have to be exposed to other bodies. <laughs> so now this is a pitch, right? This, this, this short film is a pitch. And this is what we were just doing in this room. We were doing pitches. And in 2015, when I was starting research on this project, the Silicon Valley TechCrunch Disruptor event had a medical technology as its leading pitch. And this is the clinic cloud. It basically won TechCrunch in 2015. And clinic cloud's a smartphone app promised Wi-Fi connectivity to a digital stethoscope and thermometer that would communicate key diagnostic information to a physician's miles away. So Clinical gained 5 million immediately in first round funding. It also gained a featured contract from Best Buy, the big box store, that this technology would be prominently featured in Best Buy stores. And also just as Best Buy had set up a geek squad, they could actually set up effectively a medical squad around the Clinical Cloud. Um, so impressive results for a pitch, right? And something that presented itself as disruptive and fundamentally different, fundamentally new. Ah. But who's talking to you today? I'm a historian, right? So um, how much of a break was this from the past? And I'd like to show you a page from Scientific American um, 105 years earlier. Um, it headlined an, an imminent and exciting new communications technology that would annihilate time and distance seeking care by allowing patients to purchase adapters to plug into their telephones to allow their doctors to listen to their heart from miles away through the telephone wires. So how do we compare these two, right? History doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. My point here is not that new media aren't new, but that old media were new as well, and that we've forgotten that. So that as we think about the potential of the new media that we have to work with today, it helps to think historically, right? Because um, it also helps to understand when is something considered a medical technology? Because we don't often think of the landline telephone as a medical technology. And I'd like to ask you, why that is. Um, and when new media like the telephone do dramatically transform medical practice, because the history of the telephone and medicine is not a failure, it's a resounding success, but it's a success that's so successful that we learn then not to see it. It doesn't become recognized as a medical technology anymore. It's become invisible. Um, so with this observation, I then, along with a colleague of mine, Gianna Pamata, some process to get this to work more easily, but uh, we held a conference here at Johns Hopkins back in 2015 about <coughs> how older electronic media promised to reshape medical care from the telephone to the radio, to the early, uh, to the television, to the early mainframe computer. Um, and ultimately that's the basis of this book. And these are the four sections. And I, I can mention them really briefly, but this is not a book talk, right? I'm trying to more give you some meditations on, on AI and aging today. Um, but if we think about the telephone as a medical technology, it really transformed the notion of access and accessibility of care and the relationship of what kind of care happens in the home and what kind of care happens in the clinic or hospital. Um, if we look at the radio, right? The original Wi-Fi, um, we talk about wearable technologies today as if they're new, but uh, the Holter monitor, which was which is bread and butter emergency medicine or cardiology, it's effectively a wearable device that has a couple of EKG leads that one takes home and it measures one's heart rhythms over a 48 hour period. So you can get a sense of what's happening outside of the hospital. This was invented in 1949 by Jeff Holter. And it's become such a basic concept in medicine that we don't think of it as a wearable device anymore. Um, similarly, the radio pager, right? Like what else besides a white coat or a stethoscope was more totemic than of a physician in late 20th century America than a pager, right? Um, you know, other drug dealers besides physicians were also associated with pagers. But, um, but the, my, my point here is that the pager was another unusually successful technology and manifestation of wireless Tech, wearable technology that we've learned to discount. Um, the television in medicine is perhaps easier to understand <coughs> as a pivotal moment. We could go back to 1971 when Kenneth Byrd, uh, working in, in, in Boston, 
coins the term telemedicine. Um, and he coins it as part of an experimental media laboratory that he's developed in a link, a microwave link between Massachusetts General Hospital Emergency Department, where he's sitting in a special alcove, and the Boston Logan Airport. We have developed a clinic a few miles away. And they experimented, uh, you know, uh, Bird read Marshall McLuhan would regularly talk about the work of new media and society and did very exciting work on how to imagine and prove that one could do care at a distance and deliver health care that was at least good enough. And in some cases, he argued better than he thought that the telemedical encounter could augment certain aspects of clinical medicine. Um, this became a basis of a very excited set of policies in the early 70s, thinking that this new technology of cable bi-directional cable could link up televisions and cameras in homes and clinics around the country and create a completely networked primary healthcare access site. The, the system failed, but not because the demonstrations didn't work. All of the demonstrations were successful, actually. All of the demonstration projects in rural areas and urban areas and the west side of Chicago and Harlem and the island territory of Puerto Rico, um, all of them showed telemedicine worked and was actually well acceptable and well tolerated. But what didn't emerge was actually the market basis for it, right? So the, the telehealth industry did not come out of these um, demonstrations. Um, similarly, the last part of the book is about computers. And in many ways, this is where this conference begins. And we all know here today, right, that this is not the first moment in which a dazzling promise of AI for general life, but specifically for healthcare, comes into being. And one of the things one learns by studying the history of networked mainframed computers, right, and their initial promise in medicine and healthcare in the 50s and 60s and 70s, is that healthcare was a site for imagining what AI could do in general life. Healthcare, healthcare was then and is now a crucial laboratory for the possible futures of artificial intelligence. So <laughs> that's the book in a nutshell. We can go to sleep. Um, you can, you can you know, move on for, for coffee elsewhere. But for those of you who stay, what I wanna focus on the rest of my time here is actually looking at two of these technologies, which might at first seem to have less to do with aging, um, and, and that is the telephone and the pager, and to actually think about connectivity and access and what, what happened and what was promised and what didn't happen with these earlier moments of, of technologically mediated care. And I want to remind us that we can't talk about the telephone as a singular thing or the computer or AI, right? When we talk about technology, we're talking about a changing set of objects and platforms, right? With different users and uses that actually what is taken for granted now is the result of a set of complex interactions, only part of which actually was held in the hands of the designers, right, over time. <laughs> so Bell's original telephone in 1876 is a totally different technology from the push button telephone, which then can be linked to modems and, modems and digital computers by the, by the 60s and 70s. Uh, I'd like to suggest that any new media, before it becomes old, goes through three different moments in its life. And the first would be, say, its introduction when it's an experimental medium. And this happens with the telephone. Their first doctors to use telephones, a small group in relatively elite institutions. There's then a moment of modernization, the sort of broadening of the plateau, where um, effectively, as a telephone becomes associated with practicing modern medicine, it sees rapid uptake. So if you use medical journals as a kind of a sampling device to say, who cares about telephones? At first, early 20th century, small group of people, avant-garde. By the mid 20th century, there's a rapid outburst as everyone's trying to figure out, okay, now we need to have telephones at all times. But then by the, by the second half of the 20th century, the telephone is boring. You do find telephone if you do text searches, but it's mostly just people's telephone numbers, right? Um, and I'll get to that later. But <clears throat> I want to illustrate this for you, uh, uh, you know, briefly in some broad strokes. It's, it's hard to recapture for us now the rapidity of enthusiasm and how dazzlingly new the telephone was in the late decades of the 19th century and how excited physicians were in particular and scientists about how the telephone could be used as a laboratory object. So here is a article in the British Medical Journal about how the telephone is the most possible, most sensitive possible instrument to use in a physiology laboratory to measure how, how muscles contract or not. Um, here's an article about how a telephone could be used to see bladder stones inside the body that actually couldn't be palpated. And you might think, well, this is, you know, if someone's holding a, a, a device over someone's belly 
and using the changing sound wave properties to see if there's a hidden stone in one's bladder, that's not a telephone, right? That's a diagnostic ultrasound. Um, and, and that's true. The diagnostic ultrasound is in many ways the descendant of the telephone as a diagnostic device. But in other words, we don't think of this as a telephone anymore. We've learned to think of another thing that is a medical technology that uses this property in a specialized way. Um, but in this early moment, this is a possible use of a telephone. Here's another use of a telephone in this moment, which is to hold a telephone up to someone's chest, hook it up to a rotating drum and use it to trace heart murmurs. The telephone was an instrument for a scientific laboratory. This is well before most people have telephones in their homes. So there's this early moment of a new technology in which it has all kinds of possible uses, right? It's being imagined by avant-garde users in different ways, and it hasn't yet coalesced into that familiar object that we think we know. Um, here's another use which also reminds us, hopefully, of um, the ClinCloud ad I just showed you earlier. This is an article in the British Medical Journal on the telephone as a medium of consultation and medical diagnosis. This article was re reprinted so many places around the world after it came out, but there was a Cincinnati physician who was called in the middle of the night by a exasperated parent that was worried that their child had croup, a, you know, an emergent condition. Um, and the, the, the physician said, oh, just hold your child up to the telephone. Um, and they listened to the, this child's breath and said, oh, that's not, that's not croup. You can go back to sleep. I'll see you tomorrow in my office. Um, and this circulated widely. There was an excitement. It also led in many ways to the development of this device that I was showing you earlier, this proto clinic cloud, this, this, uh, this stethoscopic um, head for a telephone. But it also led to the sense of, well, would the telephone fundamentally transform the nature of medical practice? Some people were incredibly excited. They said, well, you know, here's what telephones are going to do. Anybody in South Dakota will be able to instantly have access to CART specialists in Boston, regard as long as they can be near a telephone wire. But then there's other doctors in South Dakota or other cardiologists in between South Dakota and Boston that said, hey, wait a second. Um, are you talking about the undoing us? Are you talking about the, the death of the doctor? If, if we're not needed, if all that's needed is a telephone wire, then will telephones replace physicians? Um, and then there's folks like this, this fellow, CJ Blake, who started in one camp and ended up in another. He's a prominent prominent otologist who actually did research with Alexander Graham Bell on the telephone. He's very interested in deafness, how you could use the telephone to study deafness, among other things. Um, but he took up this claim that you could actually just do cardiology by telephone and set up some experiments and found that artifact was a huge problem. That actually, it really mattered if there's a telephone wire, if a train passed, if something, if there was a thunderstorm, you might think that you were diagnosing somebody, but actually what you were paying attention to was something completely incidental because of that separation. So we see different kinds of fear narratives that emerged around the electronic mediation of care. Um, and I'm highlighting these because I think all of us know the cognates of these fear narratives that we actually see today as well when we talk about AI in particular in care. Um, there's also exasperation about what these transformations do to the nature of medical work. So here's a, it's not a good poem, but it, it's a poem. Uh, it's a piece of doggerel published in the California State Medical Journal called Appreciation of the Telephone. And it summed up what many doctors had come to think of the telephone after it had become widespread expectation in practicing. Tinkle, tinkle, little bell, how I wish you safe in hell. And I'll also highlight a novel that appeared a year later by Ellen Firebaugh, who's actually really quite a, quite a, a, you know, a witty humorist. And it's a book called The Story of a Doctor's Telephone as Told by His Wife. And, and Mary Firebaugh was responsible for answering the four phone lines that had accumulated in their house for different kinds of medical practice. And she described the telephone as this ambivalent artifact of medical modernity, one that had the ability to save lives, right? Occasionally to reduce the need of her husband to travel, um, but which became in her words, a quote, tyrant that regularly shattered any hope of rest or leisure in their household. Um, now, similar um, concerns come up as telephones work their way, in, and we know as we talk about digital divides that telephones are not equally available to all people in all parts of the country, all economic, racial, ethnic um, categories in this country as well. And so, and yet by the 1930s, um, uh, Algernon Jackson, a, a physician at Howard University who writes a regular health comment, uh, commentary here in the Baltimore Afro-American newspaper, 
you know, chides the black community that is, you know, calling their doctors too often by telephone and demanding too much from them. So we're in this moment now, this middle moment, in which there's a lot of attention to the modernizing impulse of the, um, of the telephone. And there's some physicians, even the late 19th century, that take a fundamentally Marxist analytic that the telephone is proletarianizing the life of the physician as caregiver and producing more work and speeding up the times and the expectations that come. But as the telephone becomes a necessity in medical practice, so too do, do expectations that telephones are part of the basic infrastructure of medical care. And by, in 1960, the British Medical Journal carries the first report of a form of malpractice that had previously been impossible, which was culpable neglect of the telephone. And when we think about it, it makes sense that once the telephone becomes an expectation, a part of the infrastructure of everyday life, if you call your physician and expect a response and they don't respond and then something happens adversely, that, that is a form of neglect. But it suggests to us these complex ways that technologies take on lives that nobody initially anticipates. And if we think about this in the AI horizon, understanding the kinds of medical legal categories that emerge in this space, right, is hard to push forward and to predict. But we can think historically and imagine that we should be attending to such spaces as well. So what happens in this third phase of the telephone? So by the late 20th century, the telephone is no longer seen as an innovation. It's a platform to enable other innovations. So for example, in the 1950s, we see a lot of <coughs> enthusiasm for a new technique of telephone facsimile um, in which one can send data through a telephone and then allow on the other end, the reconstruction box by box of an X-ray image, perform studies to show that radiologists would be able to actually interpret with a good um, degree of concordance the, the lesions that are or aren't in those films. And we, we understand an entire space of communicative visual medicine that happens you know, based on this. But the telephone was not the innovation, right? The telephone is the network, it's the infrastructure. Um, similarly, in the 60s, we see the development of telecardiography. And there's telephones here, right? There's, there's a telephone right there, but it's not the exciting thing. That's the exciting thing. Um, and you know, this is developed initially in the American Midwest. These networks are created. Here we see, all, again, a telephone right here at the bedside, but really it is the, it is the transducer that allows the, X, the AKGs to move through telephone that we see. Um, here's a larger example in um, 1963 at the American Medical Association conference <coughs> in Atlantic City, there was a live display of what they called telemedography, which showed basically every possible thing, an EKG, an EMG, an EEG, uh, you know, images, anything you could put into a telephone, there was a patient in a bed in a VA hospital in Boston, and they were being actively managed from the floor of the AMA convention in Atlantic City. Um, and there's a breathless prediction here at the end of this article, quote, it is expected that a small portable telemedography set will be made available in the foreseen foreseeable future to the physician, thereby establishing his bioelectric consultant no further away than the nearest telephone plug. Now the telephone's there, but the telephone is just a plug. But what I, what's also here though, is a kind of inevitable promise, right? What's being promised here is that this new thing will come to pass. It will become routinized. It will deliver on its promise. It will improve access to care remotely for all Americans. Now this doesn't happen in 1963. Um, it doesn't mean it couldn't have happened, but it is one of many promises of equity and access that forms of electronic mediation constantly promise in medicine. And the question I have for you is not, do they ever add up, because I often do, but who follows up, right? What's, what is the agency or in this country that is tasked with following up that promises made in initial pitches of social benefit actually come to pass? Um, <clears throat> meanwhile, there's all kinds of concern about harm that emerges as well. But what I want to suggest here is this first point of this talk, which I think I've, I've ho hopefully conveyed, that successful media of care become invisible. Now, there's another question here, which is to say what kinds of power get built into the omnipresence of a medical media? Like once something becomes accepted, what else creeps in with it along the way that we also accept and don't think to criticize because we learn to naturalize it, right? And so I'm showing you here one example of different forms of power that coalesce, which is 
a part of a famous advertising um, campaign that many of you will notice from RGR Reynolds, um, the um, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette, um, <coughs> which, and what we see here though is what's being advertised is the ever accessibility of the physician um, by telephone. Um, now, one of the interesting things about studying this form of power of the inevitable, like if, if my phone rings, I'll pick it up and I'll say like, hello, or, or I'll say uh, Jeremy here, or I'll say, you know, something along those lines. Like, I'm not going to pick it up and say, you know, bananas, three cents a pound, right? Like there's, I know to say certain things, there's a script, right? And that's a script that's so natural that I don't remember ever having had to learn it, right? Um, that's part of the power that media carries with it is the fact that we don't see it. But here's a moment in the in the 50s, when physicians had to learn how to hold telephones, right? It seems silly, but it's a reminder to us that even basic bodily practices need to be scripted and taught. So one of the things you can do historically is you can look back and see, when was this so not obvious that hospitals paid consultants to teach physicians how to answer a telephone? And then that helps us understand a bit about how technology gets adopted, what it means to become naturalized. Now, we also see the harm narrative emerge throughout. So here's an article as late as 1972 from, from the journal Geriatrics <coughs> that presented three cases in which an erroneous diagnosis was made because a physician assumed a current illness on a phone call represented an exacerbation of a previous trouble when actually it was a fundamentally new trouble. Um, and um, uh, physicians by the 70s had learned to feel bound by telephone practice, that they complained about how they had to always be accessible to this device. The thing that uh, the, 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 the tinkle tinkle little bell line, the tyrant and Mary Fireboss household, physicians were some of the earliest proprietors of telephone companies, I should measure, which is say early on, physicians were themselves the venture capitalists that helped telephone networks take shape, especially in rural areas where a physician would finance the building of a telephone line because it could actually connect a neighboring community to their office. But by the late 20th century, this thing that initially affords business opportunity and leisure to the independent physician is now seen as a form of a leash. Um, and we see this also in other medical professions. Most sophisticated analysis comes from the nursing profession. Um, there's a field of telephone nursing, which takes shape very explicitly in the late 20th century. And, you know, I first, we all know this, I, I think. We've all encountered telephone nursing on some level. Um, I first became aware of telephone nursing's power when, as a young parent, I talked to my new pediatrician for my, 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 my new child. And she said, oh, don't worry, we have telephone nursing. Inevitably, you're going to freak out about something in the middle of the night, and there will be a group of wonderful nurses. They'll be sitting around. We, we have coffee for them all the time, and they will answer your questions. And, and, you know, I was inevitably that, you know, that harried parent calling and being reassured by the sorts of algorithms of care that nurses on a telephone in the middle of the night could provide for me. But what, um, what Sims and McGeer point out in the book they author called Telephone Nursing is that the telephone nurse faces a lot of challenges that the in-person nurse doesn't. For many reasons, they notice telephone communications can be stressful to the nurse, and especially so because the client is neither visible to the nurse nor present in her environment. She can compensate for these handicaps by de developing her listening skills and her intuition. She can also use effective communication skills, take care of her emotional well-being, and reduce stress, all of which promote her vital connection with her client. But what's being said here, really? Right? What's being said is that it's harder to give care through electronic mediation when you don't have the other cues of interpersonal communication. And that difficulty requires you to either overcompensate. In other words, you need to perform more in order to establish a caring relationship with a person that you're not physically with. And or you have to expect yourself to be degraded in the process such that you will be burnt out increasingly as a caregiver through this process. And that the solution that's given speaks a lot to the kinds of solutions we offer caregivers in the healthcare system right now who are increasingly burnt out. We'll say, well, you know, engage in wellness programs. Here's a yoga class. Make sure you go out for a run every now and then, eat healthy, do things to take care of yourself. Now, these are all good things to do, but they don't address the structural problem that comes from the way that we've actually set up the technological mediation. Now, there are many other forms of 
communication networks that actually reduce burnout, but we have to attend to them, right, in order to see how do we use these technologies to actually assist caregivers and reduce burnout, help them feel more connected, rather than produce the other way around. Now, as we're talking about these, what are called pleiotropic effects of technology, meaning that not all technologies produce the same kind of changes for all kinds of users, right? I want to highlight another telephone story that emerges in 1938, which is, um, here is uh, A.J. DeLong, who was featured in Boy's Life in 1938 under the title Wheelchair Business Boy. And DeLong had been, um, you know, uh, you know, had, had been wheelchair bound uh, since a young age, um, presumably due to poliomyelitis, although I, I, I can't prove that for sure. And he happened to be someone who was fascinated by radio technology and telephone technologies. He was a tinkerer. He built his own radio sets, ham radios, and he created the first doctor's answering network, the, the first doctor's answering service network for telephones in the Midwest. Um, and then he published guidelines for how other, what he called shut-ins and invalids, by which he basically meant people who would have been categorized today as disabled could actually act as entrepreneurs, set up their own businesses, use technologies like telephones and, tech and, and, and radio, and create their own meaningful businesses, performing a public health service while also actually being incredibly useful, valued members of society in spite of their perceived disabilities. And so the impact of the telephone network on someone like A.J. DeLong is an entirely different story than the impact of the telephone network of this physician who is referring to the, the, the telephone as an infernal device in, the cal in, in, his, in his poetry. And so the point I'm making here is that all of these technologies come with different stakes for different stakeholders, right? So that the medium of care is never neutral. It always matters who we're talking about. Now, in, in, the, in, in the, the last 10 minutes or so, I want to quickly show a slightly different set of narratives that come up with the pager. Um, because the, the, the pager, um, <coughs> many of you may realize this, right, was a verb before it was a noun. Um, so people were being paged in hospitals, um, by public address systems, uh, in Mount Sinai famously and inscrutably by a gong. There was a large gong in the Mount Sinai hospital, which in the first half of the 20th century would summon physicians. But even before there was paging as a verb, then there was a page as a kind of a person. And so if we think about what a page was, um, some of you may remember in Romeo and Juliet, um, as Mercutio, who, you know, lies bleeding on the ground, Romeo says to his page, says, go, page, fetch a surgeon. Um, now, he's trying to page a physician in this moment. Um, and I don't think this is wordplay. I really think this is paging a physician, but it's much earlier on. And I think this, this should come back to us, though, because part of what happens when we develop technologies is that we substitute forms of service and servant relationships in ways that because they're put into a machine, we then think are no longer a problem, but should still raise questions for us. Um, some of you will have no doubt been disturbed by being in a friend's house or a family member's house and being upset at the way that they talk to Alexa. Right? I, I feel that in a, in a conversation about AI and ethics today, the sense that one can treat a technological servant as a servant without engaging with the problems that we should be thinking of when we create class distinctions around servitude should give us some pause. Now, I'm gonna take us to a slightly different story and then come back to page boys. Um, <coughs> so here is the first pager. Um, and it is a, a pager that is sitting under the pillow of Dr. Elliot Archer. And um, you know, on a typical day in 1966, Elliot Archer, profiled in this article, woke up, reached for his watch and pager, set out for his office in downtown San Jose. And this day in particular was a typical day. Um, uh, house calls in the afternoon, hospital rounds on a sicker patients before returning home. And like most <coughs> American physicians at the time, Archer ran an independent private practice, on call 24 hours a day for the needs of his patient population. But unlike most American physicians, however, Dr. Archer was a fictional creation of the Motorola Corporation. And so Archer's typical day is orchestrated by a publication staff of Motorola that's trying to sell the pager as an artifact of everyday life and care. And really also to illustrate just how omnipresent radio communications has become in creating a seamlessness of everyday life. Um, 
Now, the, the history of the pager up to that point has two different strains. Um, and I, I talked a little bit before about how paging was already taking place in hospitals. But the first <coughs> action of paging attached to devices happened with a, with a device called the air call system. And the air call system was basically an extension of a telephone answering service. This idea is that it's great that you can now reach your doctor most of the time by telephone, either at home or office or hospital. But what about when the doctor is traveling between these places, if there is an emergency? How do you actually reach your doctor? And air calls were, were sold as a luxury service to physicians, um, promising unfettered leisure time. The idea was you could basically get buzzed, know to call your answering service that something was happening, which meant that the rest of the time you could be, be comfortable being on the golf course. And the golf course <coughs> comes up all the time in advertising for air calls. There's this idea, the golf course being at a Yankees game, going to a wedding, being on a beach. But the idea is that physicians would pay for paging as an extra service because it would give them freedom, autonomy, and leisure um, and agency. Um, now, there's a very different way of selling pagers that happen with a system called Royal Call. And it's invented by Al Gross. Al Gross is a serial entrepreneur. He invented CB radio. He had the first CB radio license. Um, and he came up with a slightly different way of using selective radio to have different buzzes go to different pagers um, in a system. And his idea was to sell it to hospital managers because if you're managing a hospital, the diff most difficult labor force to control are your physicians, highly autonomous. They could be in the hospital, outside of the hospital. But if you could put pagers on them, then you can actually find them. And the device <coughs> itself involved hardwiring a building. So you'd take a building like the Mount Sinai Hospital, and you'd take 30,000 feet of aerial cable and wrap it around every room of the building. And that way, these selective paging frequencies would work whenever a physician was in the building. And uh, Gross effectively took this, took it to the American Hospital Association Convention in 1952 and sold it. Um, and his company then gets bought by Motorola. Motorola let me into their archives. They're really quite wonderful about it, you know, helping to share industrial materials with a historian. But what's so interesting about the pager, it, it's hard to find a market like this where uh, an everyday device that has substantial market was dominated by one company, right? From the invention of the page in the 50s until Motorola finally sells its operations to Google in 2005. So I could show you tons of marketing materials. The first project is called the Handy Talkie. It is marketed to physicians in particular, also to hospitals because hospitals are seen to be a natural market because what other institutions are gonna wrap 30,000 feet of aerial wire in order to find people that are already inside, right? But Motorola then builds on this and acquires other companies to build a system of what it calls total hospital communication. And total hospital communication takes on many forms, right? Um, it has radio and closed circuit televisual technologies. They link doctors, nurses, and patients in a system of total communications that promises constant seamless connectivity. Um, now physicians are, are seen as a central market and physicians are always accessible by the pager and the pager becomes a very gendered object in this space, right? And this is something I would like for us to also attend to how technology inherently becomes gendered unless we explicitly attend to it otherwise. Now the physician's pager is often always has some chrome on it, right? It's made to actually fit conveniently in the breast pocket of a suit. Um, and it has to do with the notion that the physician is incredibly mobile, can be anywhere. The patient is the least mobile entity. So the patient basically just has a, a, like a CB radio connection. Mer nurses are somewhere in between, right? Nurses have a, are, are bound to a given floor, but they can actually, um, sorry, I, I didn't come through the way I had meant for it to, but nurses are, are bound to a, a, diff a, a given floor, but can move around within a floor. So if I can get this to, to move, uh, it's, you know, I, I feel like anytime I give a talk about technology that I just, I'm asking for some form of failure. Um, now, <laughs> this made physicians findable, but when nurses then got pages them themselves, they tend to be bigger, blockier, chunky, pastel colored things that you could kind of chonk down in the desk in a nursing pod, but not wear all over the place. And um, now this idea though, that everybody found pagers annoying um, began to be a joke that became used in the marketing of pagers themselves. Here we see the bellboy beeper, which is 
you know, also a variant of the page boy pager by, made by Motorola. And again, bellboys, page boys, these are all, um, you know, like aged and classed concepts of an appropriate um, servant to provide a concept of service involving messages. You can depend on it to make a nuisance of itself. So now these jokes weren't so funny to physicians though, right? So <clears throat> a generation of doctors that had chosen to add pages themselves based on a notion that it would increase their leisure time gets replaced by a generation of doctors that start training in hospitals in which they're forced to wear pagers. And those of you who have had a chance to read The House of God, a famous um, fictionalized memoir of the dehumanized process of training in the early 1970s at Boston's Beth Israel Hospital, um, know that uh, Samuel Shem, the fictionalized character at the center of it, is given a beeper, and he calls his beeper the, the grim beeper, and he sees the grim beeper as a key aid in the gradual dehumanizing of his existence over the course of his training as a physician, and the grim beeper, at one point, one character in the book um, just describes how jubilant he is when he just decides to turn it off and ignore the moral responsibility of medicine altogether. Um, now, at the same time, there's also a sociologist, Eviatar Zerubavil, who's studying exactly this problem of how pagers change what he calls patterns of time in hospital life. And he's, he's interested in how doctors and other caregivers experience what's called ever accessibility, this moral obligation to always be ready to deliver care. And um, basically finds a similar thing that, that a lot of young physicians find themselves resenting the pager as a is what they call an electronic leash. And what's interesting is electronic leash is exactly the term that Motorola marketers also use to market the pager um, to hospital managers. Um, but it gives rise to understanding ways in which this device that is meant initially to be so helpful becomes seen as a symbol of the degradation of everyday life through the accelerating technologization and the accelerating demands on our time. Um, now, one way of understanding this is that what physicians go through when engage, or caregivers go through in engaging with how communications technologies both make access more possible and yet make the constancy of demands of caregiving more intolerable is to think that physicians are just at one edge of a curve that actually encompasses all of us. And I'll illustrate this with the phantom pager syndrome. Have any of you encountered phantom pager syndrome before? So uh, some nods in the room, maybe a quarter of you. Um, those of you who haven't, here's an article from the British Medical Journal um, more recently from uh, 2010 about the phantom vibration syndrome, which basically suggests that there's this thing that can happen where you are you feel your phone or pager vibrating in your pocket, but then you, you look and you realize it is actually physically in a different place. And there's no way it can be vibrating in your pocket, which is to say our nervous systems have become reconditioned by the adaptive technologies that we have actually provided to increase connectivity and care in ways that produce new pathologies, right? And I say this because they, this pathology is initially studied in physicians, but I think all of us, like who's experienced that phantom vibration with your, your phone buzz in your pocket? Okay, this is about a, I'm getting about a 70% response rate here, which is to say this acceleration of expectation of caregiving is also not limited to physicians. And as all of you in this room focusing on technology and aging and caregiving know, when we talk about caregiving and restrict our samples to physicians, we're missing the boat entirely, right? Because most caregiving happens in an entirely different space by an entirely different set of actors. But these sets of actors feel the same promise, but also peril and in some ways betrayal that comes when the devices that are intended to assist them, right? Actually increase their workload. And then those devices which start out with positive affects become hated. They take on deep, densely negative affects. Um, and uh, <coughs> my colleague of mine suggested I, I call this book More Work for Doctor. Um, and this is a play on a famous book. If I could encourage all of you to read just one book in the history of technology, it'd be a book by w Ruth Schwartz Cowan called More Work for Mother. And what, what Ruth Schwartz Cowan argues is that if one looks in the history of labor saving devices in American life and consumer culture, things like dishwashers and washing machines, right? Things that are designed to reduce the gendered basis of domestic labor and actually free up more time, especially for women in households of what has been known 
gendered as women's work, right? That actually the 20th century did no such thing. The development, the routinization of these technologies, rather than reducing the amount of labor time that women spent in the household, just increased the expectations of cleanliness in American society and increased the number of hours spent doing labor. So that labor saving devices over the 20th century did no such thing. And so I ask this question of you as a crowd today, which is to ask, how do we make sure that the kinds of innovations that we're producing today to help support the complex labor of caregivers um, make good on those promises rather than making more work for caregivers as well? And um, it, it, it's a challenge here in this moment in which the electronic health record, which was promised as a labor saving device for caregivers, right, is now the number one cited reason for the increased burnout of the medical, nursing, and healthcare, healthcare professions, right? And we know, I know this, I'm a primary care doctor. I, I just came from my clinic this morning at the East Baltimore Medical Center. I will be doing charting tonight in my electronic health record portal, right? Now, on the one hand, it's great that I can be here, right? Because otherwise I would be there, you know, physically still writing in charts instead of talking to you, right? But at the same time, my kids know to expect that I will be doing a certain amount of work at night because there is just that much more work to do. So that's a quick run through two technologies that we don't think of necessarily when we think of AI and aging, um, but whose stories I hope give us some lateral things to think about as we talk about the promise and peril of the approach to AI and aging care today. Um, and as we understand that actually, um, what actually transforms is oftentimes neither the hopes nor the fears as they're throatily stated by futurists at the beginning of a new technology, but more lateral subtle ways in which change takes place. Now, um, this, both of these stories hinted at a broader question that I didn't really take up fully today, which is this question of whether technology can undo disparities in access to care. And I'd like to leave you with just a speculation in this space. It's something I find myself thinking a lot about as a, as a historian and a physician who started researching telehealth in 2015, I didn't expect to become a telepractitioner in 2020. All of us did, and all of us learned to be telepatients. And I remember especially as, some, of, some of my encounters with a telepatient were fantastic, but I remember one particularly awkward one where, you know, as a, as a, pale, you know, white guy with a bunch of moles, I see a dermatologist once a year just to make sure they're all you know, being kept in line. And that dermatology visit when I had to stand outside um, in my underwear on my porch, like documenting myself from multiple angles with my phone felt to me like it, 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 was, it was a form of research for this book that I had not expected to do. But what, what I'm trying to suggest though is that I became a teledoctor because the community health center that I work in as an urgent care physician, which has an all comers policy, it's a safety net institution. We see a high proportion of Latinx patients. Um, we see a high proportion of African-American patients. Our clinic was set up actually by black community members in East Baltimore um, to have a community health center in a, um, in a great society model in 1968, um, especially across the street from the Latrobe Homes public housing project right across the street. So it, it was a surprise to realize that when we shut our doors, but switched to all telemedicine, it dramatically transformed the character of the patients that I got to see. Um, and so our, my safety net clinic, for the first month of telepractice, I did not see in a complete audio visual telehealth setting, a single African American or Latinx patients. All the patients I saw were white middle-class patients. Now they had wonderful plugins, right? And they had, you know, pulse oximeters and ability to connect to glucometers and the digital health connectivity thing was working for them. But I wasn't seeing the patients that I, a huge chunk of the patients that I usually saw. And the irony here is that when telehealth was invented, it was supposed to be something that could democratize access in urban and rural areas. So I wasn't the only person to realize this, right? So, you know, other practitioners in Boston, in Chicago, in New York, began realizing that in the early months of the pandemic, telehealth increased disparities rather than decreased disparities in access to care. And, um, you know, I wanna give my colleagues here at Johns Hopkins some credit. There's 
Uh, the Office of Telehealth quickly set up an Office of Telehealth Equity, and my colleagues Helen Hughes and Brian Hasselfeld began to study and try to understand, well, what is it about this format that is getting in the way? They rejiggered the format <laughs> so it could be more easily ad adaptable to anybody on a smartphone, and gradually we actually saw these barriers lower in equity and access return. But we still found there are some people for whom Telehealth wasn't possible in terms of audio visual. Telephone was the only way that they could get care. And thankfully, under the emergency provisions, this old technology of the telephone could be used and could be built and provided a, a means of providing care to those who couldn't access the telehealth suite. If you look here, here's a map of some zip codes in Baltimore. Circled in blue is the, um, the neighborhood I live in, uh, Roland Park. Um, if I bike six miles here, here you see 21205, 21213, which is where we are and where my clinic is. Um, and we can see a few things here, right? So it's part of this patchwork that is the city of Baltimore. 21210, median income is more than 100,000. 21205, median income is less than 40,000. 9% Black, 5% Hispanic in 21210, 87% Black, 2% Hispanic in 21205, 21213. Um, and now we look at rates of telephone only um, access to telehealth. Especially if we add age, if we look at the older population, we see really substantial differences, right, between these spaces. And this is just the most crude cut of zip codes and very crude census categories that we can look at. But the point is that there's a substantial chunk of the population. Yes, what we should do is get to the point where the telehealth suite, the full telehealth suite, is equally available to all people. But if we were to insist that only full telehealth was a reimbursable visit, we would cut off all remote access to a substantial part of the population. So it's this kind of feedback loop that we need to actually see, are the promises of equity that our technologies afford being delivered on? And if not, how do we loop back? How do we change things? How do we make equitable policy that reflects the realities we live within? So that's my lecture. I'll give you a brief coda on the clinic cloud. Have any of you gotten to use a clinic cloud? No, I was hoping in this group, maybe someone. Um, as you may have guessed, um, this was an imminent new technology when I began this work in 2015. The Best Buy deal really cemented it. By 2017, its Facebook page had more than 10,000 likes. It was favorably reviewed in The Lancet. The FDA worked to develop a new category of regulations to help green light other clinic cloud peripherals, like a blood oximeter and a blood pressure cuff, right? But Clinic Cloud doesn't exist anymore. Um, the, it, it went under just a few years later. It did not find that usership. Um, this was even well before the pandemic, it had nothing to do with COVID-19. The, the piece that I was passing around, which I'm hoping will make it back to me eventually, but if it doesn't, you know, don't worry about it because unlike the kind of $250 price tag it had originally, I bought a stack of 10 of them for $5 from eBay, right? Because they're, they're worthless, because you can't download the app to use them. And I want to suggest that we've forgotten about ClinCloud. I think that's clear. Even though it was something that was seen as imminent, disruptive technology, won its pitches, got its connections, was poised to succeed. And we've also forgotten about the telephone. And we forget about one because it's a failure. We forget about the other because it's a success. And to gather these three themes, I focus on the hype, hope, and harm of new media. But it also, I want to suggest that hype, hope, and harm misses the lateral ways in which media become most powerful. Um, that I've told you a story about labor-saving devices that produce more labor in the hopes that we can actually follow through and make sure that those savings are real in the devices that we produce in the future. That this burnout is real, but the benefits and the new possibilities for different stakeholders are real as well. In short, the medium of care is never neutral. It does not affect all providers or all patients in the same way. It's constantly and continuously being shaped and reshaped by actors with material interest in the making of what then comes to be taken for granted. And these histories are essential if we are to understand the systems we take for granted ourselves and work to shape out how we can build new ones that might be more equitable in the future. Thanks so much for your attention today. It's been a real pleasure joining you. All right, thank you so much for this great talk. We do have time for questions if folks in the audience have questions. Yeah, thanks so much. So the question is um, pointing out that I didn't mention anything about home visits and how do we connect them. So 
on the one hand, uh, you know, the telephone and the pager are both immediately connected to home visits, right? And that they're, they're means of summoning the physician, right? Or in some cases, as with the Cincinnati physician that asks for the patient to be basically fed through the telephone themselves, they're means of the physician of actually pushing back, right? <laughs> and on the other end, the, the advent of telemedicine, and, and we've seen, we saw this in the 60s and 70s, we saw it even more powerfully in, in this abrupt sort of immersion we all had in telehealth in 2020 was to provide a new kind of return to the home visit as well. And, and I think this is, this is really quite real. Um, one of the things that's fascinating in the early 70s as all of these policymakers are assuming that cable mediated telehealth is gonna be the new wave of access equity in the, in, the, in the 70s for primary healthcare is a bunch of medical sociologists start getting involved. So some of you may know the work of Irving Goffman, who was a Penn sociologist, who wrote a book called The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. And he was, he was a very widely known sociologist, talked about role theory, that, that we all take on different roles in different parts of our lives. <clears throat> and Goffman believed that one of the things that the televisit did is by allowing the patient to see the doctor from the comfort and security and dense social connection of their own home is that it created a disconnect that actually helped, right? That this disconnect took away the asymmetry of power, right? We all know, right? You sit on the exam table, you have a, a thin paper Johnny, maybe it's open at the back, maybe it's open in the front. It's certainly not made to make you feel comfortable or at home or embedded. You feel like you are a patient being made visible in a sterile space, right? And so this idea is that it, the telehealth could restore symmetry to the doctor-patient relationship, right? Um, Goffman even suggested it restored a certain kind of symmetry in what he called the right to touch, right? Because a doctor can touch you in ways that you may or not be prepared for, but in a way that is, is less likely, you know, if, if a random person touched you in these ways, you know, you could immediately involve the police, right? So similarly though, in a, in a clinic visit, if a patient were to try and touch the doctor in the way the doctor is accustomed to touching the patients, that will result in a call to the security guard. And Goffman pointed out, well, you know, when you have a telehealth visit, you've got a symmetry of the right to touch. Nobody can touch anybody. So there's all these ways in which life is restored. You can see the patient and the complexity of their worldview. And, and I've noticed this myself as, a, as, a, as someone who kind of got dragged into telepractice in the pandemic, that I could learn so much about the lives of the people I was talking with by seeing them in their house. And so it did restore certain elements of the home visit or they could be in their house and I could see what their local resources were if we were trying to set up a kind of a care network or practice. I could talk to their family members there as well. Um, <clears throat> there's other slightly more sinister dimensions of this as well. So, and I'm not the only one to notice this, but I get a lot of urgent care calls, telehealth calls from people who are driving forklifts in Amazon warehouses, right? And on the one hand, it is true that it is increasing access by allowing someone to actually get a visit to a doctor without having to stop work. On the other hand, there's a whole set of reasons why we allow people to not work to actually go visit a doctor. And, but then again, there's all kinds of other conventions that Amazon doesn't follow. Like we tend to allow people to go to the bathroom, right? Without like measuring and docking that time from their paycheck, but Amazon famously does so. And it's one of the uses of the Amazon Halo wearable devices is it tracks the physiological parameters of workers in order to exert more physiological control over productivity. So I'm trying to say that actually this kind of view, which is also a view that physicians have historically had since Virchow in the 19th century, that the physician is a natural advocate for the poor, that the physician can understand the, the injurious effects of changing labor practices on workers, that actually this kind of disturbing access, it's not a home visit, it's a work visit, right? Which is something entirely different that actually telehealth has opened up. That's sorry, that's a long answer, but it's a really good question. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so you're, you're, and you're pointing out here that you know, it takes away the white coat effect. And so there's a literature, especially in psychiatry, and many of you here are specialists in, in telepsychiatry and telemental health. And we know the ways in which AI in particular has already demonstrated right, such a strong role in increasing access to skilled mental health interventions. right? Um, and I, I saw some posters here having to do with interventions for dementia and delirium as well. So, one of the questions um, that, that emerges in the mid 20th century is psychiatrists begin to realize that actually there are some forms of psychiatric relationships that are better on the telephone, right? There's pediatricians begin to realize in the 70s that kids are less scared of seeing a doctor over a television. This is a famous demonstration project that takes place in Harlem showing that um, people living in tenements in East Harlem can have telemedical access to pediatric clinics in Mount Sinai Hospital. And uh, it's, it's, it's routinely noted that kids are more comfortable and more relaxed when the doctor is you know, on a screen rather than next to them. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. So, um, and I'm just going to paraphrase for those who couldn't hear that this is, you know, noting that in-home care is a is, is an overwhelming concern of many of the um, the attendees and presenters at this event. Um, that you know, <coughs> how does one learn from ClinCloud and other ventures so that we can um, have more success in uptake of in-home care models? Um, I think that. Uh, you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be speculating here, right? Because uh, there's only so much I know about the Clinic Cloud case itself. But I do think that one of the problems that we see is how do we make sure, um, on the one hand, that the value that is added by a given program is corresponding to the needs of the users, on the one hand, and that whether those users are caregivers or patients or or, or family members or both, um, and on the other hand. How do we make sure that that value once perceived lines up with regulatory categories, especially around reimbursement, such that those who actually make the fundamental decisions over whether something will or will not be purchasable or reimbursable, or who bears the costs of it, right, to make it accessible, actually lines up. And so I think I'm telling you something that you probably know a lot more about than I do, but one of the ways in which you think about it from both regulatory history, which I'm very interested in, and, um, and technology user studies, which I'm very interested in, is that so much of the literature we have on technology focuses on innovators, right? And focuses on the genius that comes up with an idea, right? Or a group of people that can actually perceive a need and come up with a solution for it, right? And we find the most success when users themselves are given a space in the collaborative process that's something more than a focus group, right? Or a marketing panel, but actually tantamount to what I would call co-design. And so I think that, um, you know, I think there's a fascinating example. I could send references about a, um, a telemed practice that is designed in, um, in, uh, in West Africa to actually help, um, help train community birth attendants and make them available. And that, the, that, when this, when this program was studied a few years later, it turned out to be remarkably successful, but it wasn't following the protocols that were initially set out by the study designers. In fact, the, the, um, the community birth attendants had found entirely different ways to use the cell phones than what had actually been actually prescribed for them, which is to say that we actually know that users themselves are innovators, right? And DeLong is a good example on some level. Like here is someone 
who figures out a way to create a market from a technology that was not designed for this. So that's the user side of things. And I think in technology studies, focusing on users in the process has been so, has been users as innovators has become a key part of it. In the regulatory studies, I think we have to understand, and you again also have to, you've been dealing with this in different ways than I have, that the regulatory agencies are always hopelessly behind in this process, right? So I, <laughs> on the one hand, <laughs> You know, there's a media history one could do of the Food and Drug Administration, right? Like, what is the Food and Drug Administration set up to do in 1904, right? It's set up to regulate labels, right? So this is a this initially means a, when we talk about the label or indication for a drug, that initially meant a physical label stuck onto a drug. What did it actually say on it? And so the metaphysical label, right, which is what the FDA now traffics in, had to all expand. All of the regulatory power had to expand from having power over a physical label, which is why we still call it labeling. But this is just to say that when the FDA is created, there's, you know, there is not radio in everyday life or widespread telephones in everyday life or television. So trying to understand how actually regulating the media in which claims are made, the FDA is always you know, behind in this process. Um, for something that is a very forward leading agency, it's a real challenge. So and especially in a world, and again, I'm going to come back to that observation that, you know, 99.6% of drug targets fail, and yet we still tend to prioritize drugs as a solution to Alzheimer's. When we look at the regulatory mechanisms that the FDA has available to it, so many of them are still designed around drugs, right? I'm working right now on a project looking at the history of medical trash, how medicine, how medical technologies become disposable. And I started looking at syringes, because syringes used to be glass and reusable, and they're now plastic and their iconic trash, right? Dangerous trash. And I found that the FDA got interested in syringes when they were drugs. And in order to regulate syringes, the FDA had to be able to categorize them as drugs. So when is a syringe a drug, right? A syringe is a drug when something about the claims of a syringe come to claims of safety or efficacy of its use. So if you're using insulin and the syringe has hash marks about how much insulin is in a syringe, then those hash marks are making a claim about the efficacy of the insulin. And so then, then the syringe becomes regulatable. But what I'm sketching out here is how convoluted this pathway of regulation is, right? Because, you know, why is it that at-home care would have to be regulated as a drug, right? And yet these are the terms in a way that in order to get the, de like device goes through drug, goes through this longer genealogy of how the FDA can share. It's a longer answer, but it still comes down to these fundamentally, these two interfaces, right? How to actually attend in close ways that allow users to be collaborative designers, right? Um, and understand that, that the product, even once it's developed, is gonna be flexible. It's not gonna remain static, just like the telephone didn't. And then also how to understand how the regulatory mechanism needs to be thought of from the beginning. It's something that's going to be a problem that one needs to anticipate, you know, educating and bringing with a regulatory mechanism that is fundamentally not designed to manage the innovation that you're producing. Yeah, so I mean, I, and I have, I have a lot of, I have a lot of sympathy here, and um, again, I, I, you know, I, I don't have the power to, of course, reduce those barriers, right? But I do think if one can make visible the costs of unnecessarily um, applying a set of barriers and thresholds that are being dragged in from another place or another category of object into this space. 
right? And then ask the question of well, where should the burden of proof be? What are the harms that are really viable by not allowing use of a technology versus the harms that actually come from not making it available at all, right? And I think that I think that it is making that case in public forum, right? So you know, for example, in, <coughs> this is a different category. But I, I'm going to come back to insulin, which is a subject I've been very interested in as an example of a complex form of innovation, which, you know, as we all know now, insulin's developed in the 1920s. It, you know, 100 years later, there's barely any, no true generic market for this drug, right? And efforts now to actually finally create competitive insulin markets. And it's an industry that became, you know, not monopolized, but part of an oligopoly of three firms that kept prices very high, right? And so one of the questions is, well, how do we understand market failures? What are the regulatory structures that, that allow them to persist? And part of the problem with insulin is a set of requirements, right? A sense that, that human insulins might be inherently harmful, even though there was no proof that competitive projects were, products were actually dangerous. And so really, really high standards of proof were held in order to bring any new competitive biosimilar insulin into the market. Um, and, you know, this is part of a complex way in which affordable insulin was stifled and small businesses or large businesses just had no incentive to create competitive insulin products. So, you know, a, a team of folks here at Hopkins uh, as part of, um, you know, testified repeatedly at FDA hearings about ways of changing insulin regulations and say, well, exactly this question, why are we insisting on a high burden of proof for a theoretical harm that has been never demonstrated when that high burden of proof we know is associated with the non-theoretical evident harm that the inaccessibility and high price of this drug that is a century old is creating. And so let's reevaluate the way that we think of which form of harm is more dangerous right now. And the FDA was actually very sympathetic and changed their regs and actually adopted a new approach to biosimilar insulins, which among other things has actually, you know, it's been part of a process that has helped lead to a more competitive insulin market emerging in just recent years. I'm not saying that we made that happen, but that there are these spaces to actually lean into the regulatory process and actually ask these tough questions. Thank you. Um, I'm going to question one of, the, one of your premises in terms of the value of telehealth. Um, so first, I'll say that I am a technologist. I run a medical device innovation group. Um, in a former company, I actually brought in uh, remote tele-ICU. So, but um, I'm also a patient. And um, I'm kind of curious about to what extent you've asked your patients um, the value of a televisit. I had a televisit for my PCP. It was a waste of time of me. I think it was a waste of his time. I appreciate his time. Um, and uh, I, I'm lucky because I, I can actually measure my blood pressure every day, my heart rate. I have medical devices lying around the lab, right? It's not a problem. But I, I wonder, I felt like uh, my PCP was in fact checking a, a quality metric, basically, that said that he did an annual with me. Over, over the phone. And I, I question the utility of the televisit and how successful it is and whether patients actually see it as, as valuable. Yeah, <clears throat> so that's a, it's a great point. And you're, you know, your, your experience here is, is not unique, right? There's, there are many people who find televisits to be really unsatisfying, right? Um, <clears throat> and, I think that you know, hopefully you have the option for your next annual to decide whether you want a televisit or not, right? And that you just you find more value in the in-person visit. I know that currently in the NHS, as it is being rejiggered right now, many people don't have that option. So increasingly, primary care in the NHS is being shunted into televisits. And there's a lot of critique of that right now by many people who feel that there is something being lost that is not being captured in the quality metrics, but is being lost all the same. Um, so one way I would answer this is to come back to pleiotropy. I would certainly say as a telepractitioner, there are times in which I feel that it's a waste of my time as well, that both of us are wasting each other's time in an encounter that really should be happening here. If you were right here, I could look in your ear. 
I could see what's happening. And while you're kind of doing this, you know, I can't see anything. What are we, what are we even doing here? But then there are other forms of care in which it's the opposite, right? In which making you come to the clinic um, when all we really need to do is check a quick parameter and actually we can have a meaningful connection or actually most of what needs to happen is in the conversation. And because we know each other and we already have rapport, um, we can actually do a lot of work in that space. So it leads to a couple of observations, right? Which is that on the one hand, as we roll out things like telehealth, as we roll out other forms of digitally assisted forms of caregiving, we need to allow for the possibility that even as it engenders and enables possibilities of access for those who otherwise would not have had them or builds in new convenience or quicker feedback loops and therefore delivers greater efficacy in some conditions, it might do the opposite in others. And if we're not paying attention to that, then we're participating in degrading care to only that which we already capture in our quality matrices, which is to kind of commit a Rumsfeldian error, right? And many of us will remember that Donald Rumsfeld had these three categories of the known knowns, the known, known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. So there's a lot that happens um, in an in-person visit that can't quite be captured exactly what it is. What's interesting is if you go back to the beginnings of telehealth, um, in the 1970s, the Rockefeller Foundation commissions a report, um, a fascinating report, and the author of this report, Ben Park, tries to basically catalog all of the different things that are present in telehealth and all the things that are missing. Um, and, and, it's, and it finds it's impossible to, to actually get at all of those intangibles, right? Um, so that's why I don't actually think telehealth will simply replace in-person medicine, um, but it becomes this form of balancing. I'll frame it one more time in a slightly different way too, which is to say, if telehealth, if in those areas where telehealth can produce equivalent value at greater efficiency of access, then denying that, not reimbursing it, not making it possible, is committing an injury to those populations who otherwise wouldn't make it into the clinic, right? Um, but if telehealth produces a form of care that is not as good, then insisting on it is to insist on a degraded form or a two-tier sense of who gets what level of health care and why, right? And I think both of these harms are real forms of harm that have always been there in the, in the question of digitally mediated health and that we should really keep in the focus. We're not going to be able to resolve them, but we should keep feedback loops to make sure that we're not assuming that we're actually doing one when we're doing the other. But thank you, that's a really important point. Hi, right, great talk. Um, yeah, I, I want, was wondering if we could revisit uh, the example, was it ClinicCloud? Did I mm -hmm. say that right? Um, it's and, floating somewhere in the back at this point. Yeah. <laughs> and, a, and a lesson as to why that you know, might've failed. Um, you know, it seems to me that part of the issue might've been its labeling as disruptive technology to begin with. Yeah. Um, certainly in, in, the, in the context of the talk you just gave, right, it, it appears to be more of one of those rhymes or echoes of a uh, hundred similar ideas. And the issue with why it failed might've been more, it wasn't addressing you know, a truly novel problem, right? It was just a new platform to achieve the same goal without addressing the underlying idea of how, do you, how does the clinician manage this data? How does it not make the clinician feel tied down and bound, you know, like you know the telephone example you were giving, and so can we use history? Is this another example of history? You know, we avoid future failures by just being more aware of historical examples. Yeah, thanks. That's that's a fascinating point, and I I, I do agree. Right, as a historian, you know, it's not like we want to just focus on continuity or change, right? And we always want to attend to both of them, and. Sometimes in overemphasizing a rupture that then disappoints, right? One can miss the fact that arguing for continuity is actually okay, right? That this is an extension of a long tradition of actually trying to deliver this kind of value and now we can do it this way. Or that the challenge is that when you take that frame, one might realize, well, actually, what is the clinical cloud really doing? And can't anyone kind of figure out a way to do that on their own? And what's the real unique value of this premise? Um, and how can it actually be held onto and build on in a way that really builds an association with a particular company, a particular brand or, or, or practice. And I think another way I might answer that is to think about the, you know, I showed you two paging companies that didn't become Motorola, right? And 
you know, air call worked in its own way, but we don't really remember air call. Um, Royal call was just a blip, you know, Al Gross came, and Al Gross was a serial inventor. He kind of worked like this. And I'm sure many of you know serial inventors and entrepreneurs who come up with an idea of, you know, move along. And the real challenge is, you know, coming up with a new thing. And that was gross to a T. Um, but, you know, Royal Call took it to the American Hospital Association, thought it would go over big. It didn't sell. Um, and then when Motorola came calling and said, hey, we're interested, that was, that was success for, for gross. But then Motorola lived with this thing built the whole concept, this new market of a pager, is now an everyday device. Well, now we're forgetting about it again. I gave a talk to um, Middlebury College students um, just earlier this week for whom the pager was like a fascinating, nostalgic concept, um, kind of in the way that say like vinyl is, right? Although vinyl, in fact, which is going, undergoing a comeback in a way that pagers aren't. But it's just to say that it, it's not unusual in the history of technology that the innovator company is not actually successful, right? And so one of the questions is, what are those other things, right, that come with the, su the successful, you know, uh, you know, recruitment of all parties that, 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 that actually need to be brought on board for something to work? But I really appreciate your attention to continuity being as important to innovators than disruption. And if we overemphasize disruption innovation, we miss the real things that cause technologies to work in people's lives. So I think we're running out of time. I want to thank you again for this great talk and the great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks again. It's been a pleasure.